There are certain themes of absorbing interest, but too horrible to be the subject of a work of fiction. The good romantic writer must avoid them if he does not want to offend or be disgusting. They are only treated appropriately when it is serious and majestic of truth sanctify and sustain them. We shudder, for example, with the most intense, pleasant pain, before the stories of the passage of the Beresina, of the Lisbon earthquake, of the plague of London and the massacre of St. Bartholomew or death by suffocation of the 123 prisoners in the black hole of Calcutta. But in these stories what is exciting is the fact, the reality, history. As fictions, they would simply seem to us abominable. I have mentioned some of the most prominent and august calamities that history records, but in them the scope, not less than the character of the calamity, is what so impresses vividly the imagination. I need not remind the reader that, of the long and horrible catalogue of human miseries, there could be chosen many individual examples fuller of suffering essential than any of those immense general disasters. The true misfortune, the ultimate affliction, is actually particular, not diffuse. Let us thank the merciful God that the horrible extremes of agony are suffered by man individually and never in mass. Being buried alive is, without a doubt, the most terrifying extreme that has never fallen to the lot of a mere mortal. What the premature burial has fallen into luck often, very often, no one with capacity of judgment will deny it. The limits that separate life from death are, at best, blurry and indefinite. Who could say where one ends and the other begins? We know that there are diseases in which a cessation occurs total of the apparent functions of life, and yet that cessation it is nothing more than a suspension, to call him by his name. There are only temporary pauses in the incomprehensible mechanism. After a certain period, some mysterious hidden principle puts again in motion the magical pinions and wheels fantastic. The silver rope was not let loose forever, nor the golden vessel irreparably broken. But in the meantime, where was the soul? However, apart from the inevitable a priori conclusion that such causes must produce such effects, that the well-known cases of life on hold, again and again, inevitably cause premature burials, apart from this consideration, we have the direct testimony of medical experience and the common people who prove that a large number of these burials actually take place. I could relate right now, if necessary, a hundred well-known examples tested. One with very amazing characteristics, and whose circumstances are still alive in the memory of some of my readers, it happened not long ago in the neighboring city of Baltimore, where it caused a painful, intense, and very extended. The wife of one of the most respectable citizens, eminent lawyer and member of Congress, was attacked by a sudden and inexplicable illness, which outwitted the ingenuity of the doctors. After suffering much he died, or it is assumed that died. Nobody suspected, and there was really no reason to, that she was not truly dead. It presented all the common appearances of death. The face had the usual contracted and submerged contour. The lips showed the usual marble pallor. The eyes had no brightness. The heat was missing. The pulsation stopped. For three days the body was without berry, and in that time, it acquired a stony rigidity. In short, the funeral for the rapid advance of what was assumed to be decomposition. The lady was deposited in the family crypt, which remained closed for the next three years. When that period expired, it was open to receive a sarcophagus, but, alas, what a terrible shock awaited the husband when he personally opened the door. When pushing the gates, an object dressed in white fell grinding in his arms. It was the skeleton of his wife with the shroud on. Careful investigation showed evidence that she had revived two days after being buried, that her struggles within the coffin had caused it to fall from a ledge or niche to the ground, and when the coffin broke, he was able to get out of it. One appeared empty lamp that had accidentally been left full of oil, inside the tomb, may, however, 
have been consumed by evaporation. On the upper rungs of the ladder descended into the dreadful crypt there was a piece of the coffin, with the which, apparently, the woman had tried to attract attention hitting the iron door. While doing this, I probably he fainted or perhaps died from sheer terror, and when he fell, the shroud got tangled in some piece of iron that was protruding inward. Over there it remained and thus rotted, upright. In 1810 a case of burial took place in France prematurely, in circumstances that go a long way to justifying the statement that says that truth is stranger than fiction. The heroine of the story was Mademoiselle Victorine La Forcade, a young woman from an illustrious family, rich and very beautiful. Among its numerous suitors included Julien Bossuet, a poor man of letters or Paris journalist. His talent and kindness had awakened the attention of the heiress who, apparently, had fallen in love really from him, but caste pride finally led her to reject him and to marry a certain Monsieur Renel, banker and diplomat of certain renown. After marriage, however, this gentleman neglected his wife and perhaps hit her. After spend some unhappy years she died, at least its status it looked so much like death that it deceived everyone who saw it. She was buried, not in a crypt, but in a common tomb, in her native village. Desperate and still inflamed by the memory of his deep affection, the lover traveled from the capital to the distant province where the village was located, with the romantic purpose to dig up the corpse and take possession of its precious hair. He arrived at the grave. At midnight he dug up the coffin, opened it and, when he was going to cut the hair, he stopped before the eyes of the beloved, who opened. The lady had been buried alive. The vital pulsations had not completely disappeared, and the caresses of her beloved woke her up from that lethargy that she mistakenly had been mistaken for death. Desperate, the young man took her to your accommodation in the village. He employed some powerful restoratives advised by their considerable knowledge doctors. In short, she revived. He recognized his savior. Remained with until he slowly and gradually regained his health. His heart does not he was so hard, and this last lesson in love was enough to soften him. It handed over to Bossuet. She did not return to her husband, but, hiding his resurrection, he fled with his lover to America. Twenty years later, the two returned to France, convinced that the passage of the time had changed the lady's appearance so much that her friends couldn't recognize her. But they were wrong, because at first meeting Monsieur Renel recognized his wife and claimed her. She rejected the claim and the court supported it, ruling that the strange circumstances and the long period that had elapsed had abolished, not only from an equitable point of view, but legally the authority of the husband. The Leipzig Journal of Surgery, a publication of great authority and merit, which some American editor would do well to translate and publish, in one of the last numbers, he recounts a very sad event which presents the same characteristics. An artillery officer, man of gigantic stature and excellent health, was knocked down by an untamed horse and suffered a very serious bruise. Serious injury to the head, which left him unconscious. I had a slight skull fracture but no immediate danger was perceived. The trepanation was done successfully. An indentation was applied and they adopted many other common remedies. But it fell slowly in an increasingly serious drowsiness and was finally presumed dead. It was hot and they buried him with unseemly haste in one of the public cemeteries. His funeral took place on a Thursday. To the following Sunday, the cemetery park, as usual, was filled with visitors, and about noon there was a great commotion, caused by the words of a peasant who, having sat on the officer's grave, he had felt himself stir the earth, as if someone was fighting below. At first no one he paid too much attention to this man's words, but his evident terror and the stubborn insistence with which he repeated his story they finally produced their natural effect on the crowd. Some they quickly got some shovels, and the grave, shamefully superficial, 
was in a few minutes so open that it left the uncovered the head of its occupant. It gave the impression that was dead, but appeared almost sitting inside the coffin, whose lid, in furious struggle, had partially lifted. He was immediately taken to the nearest hospital, where he was, he was declared alive, although in a state of asphyxiation. After a few hours came to his senses, recognized some familiar people, and with phrases disjointedly recounted his agonies in the grave. From what he said, it was clear that the victim maintained consciousness of life for more than an hour after burial, before lose your senses they had filled the grave, without realizing it, with a very porous, uncrushed earth, and that's why it got a little air. He heard the footsteps of the crowd above his head and in turn tried to to be heard. The tumult in the cemetery park, he said, was what which surely woke him up from a deep sleep, but at waking up he realized the awful horror of his situation. This patient, as the story goes, was improving and seemed headed towards a definitive restoration, when it fell victim of the quackery of medical experiments. You will apply the galvanic battery and suddenly expired in one of those static paroxysms that it sometimes produces. The mention of the galvanic battery, however, brings me to the memory a well-known and very extraordinary case, in which his action turned out to be the way to bring a young lawyer back to life from London who was buried for two days. This occurred in 1831, and then it made a deep impression everywhere, where it was topic of conversation. The patient, Mr. Edward Stapleton, had died, apparently typhoid fever accompanied by some symptoms anomalous that aroused the curiosity of their doctors. After of his apparent death, his friends were asked for permission for a post-mortem examination, but they refused. As often happens when faced with these refusals, doctors they decided to dig up the body and examine it thoroughly, in private. They easily reached an agreement with one of the numerous groups of body snatchers that abound in London, and the third night after the burial, the supposed corpse was unearthed from a grave eight feet deep and deposited in the operating room of a private hospital. When a long incision is made in the abdomen, the fresh and uncorrupted appearance of the subject suggested the idea of applying the battery. They did successive experiments with the effects accustomed, without anything special in any sense, except, in once or twice, an appearance of life greater than norm in a certain convulsive action. It was already late. It was about to dawn and it was finally thought appropriate to proceed immediately to dissection. But one of the scholars had a special desire to experiment with his own theory and insisted on apply the battery to one of the pectoral muscles. After performing a rough incision, contact was hastily established, then the patient, with a quick movement but nothing convulsively, he got up from the table, walked towards the center of the room, he looked around uneasily for a few moments and then speak. What he said was unintelligible, but he uttered a few words, and he syllabled clearly. After speaking, he fell heavily to the ground. For a few moments everyone was paralyzed with fear, but the urgency of the case soon restored their presence of mind. Mr. Stapleton was seen to be alive, although unconscious. After administering ether, he came to and quickly regained consciousness. Health, returning to the society of his friends, whom, without however, all news about the resurrection was hidden from them until a relapse was no longer feared. One can imagine their wonder and their ecstatic astonishment. The most horrifying fact about this incident, however, is found in what Mr. Stapleton himself stated. I declare that at no time did it lose all meaning, which in a blurred way and confused he perceived everything that was happening to him from the moment when he was declared dead by doctors until he fell passed out on the hospital floor. I am alive were the misunderstood words that, upon recognizing the dissection room, had tried to pronounce in that grave moment of danger. It would be easy to multiply stories like these, but I refrain, because in reality we do not need them to establish the fact that premature burials happen. 
When we reflect, in the rare times when, due to the nature of the case, we have the possibility of discover them, we must admit that perhaps more occur often than we think. In fact, they have almost never removed many graves from a cemetery, for some reason, without those skeletons appeared in positions that suggest the most dreadful of suspicions. Suspicion is frightening, but fate is more frightening. It can be affirmed, without hesitation, that no event lends itself so much to lead to the height of physical and mental anguish such as burial before death. The unbearable oppression of the lungs, the suffocating emanations of the humid earth, the shroud that adheres, the rigid embrace of the narrow abode, the darkness of the absolute night, the silence like an overwhelming sea, the invisible but palpable presence of the victorious worm. These things, together with the desires of the air and the grass that grow above, with the memory of the dear friends who would fly to save us if we will learn of our destiny, and the awareness that they will never be able know it, that our irremediable fate is that of the dead of truth, these considerations, I say, carry the heart even throbbing to a degree of frightening and unbearable horror at the which the boldest imagination recoils. We don't know anything so distressing on earth, we cannot imagine anything so horrible in the domains of the deepest hell. And that's why all the stories on this topic awaken a deep interest, an interest that, however, thanks to the fearful reverence towards this topic, depends fairly and specifically on our belief in the truth of the narrated matter. What I am going to tell now is my knowledge real, my effective and personal experience. For several years I suffered attacks of that strange disorder that doctors have decided to call it catalepsy, for lack of a name that better define it. Although both the immediate causes and the predispositions and even the diagnosis of this disease continue being mysterious, their character evident and manifest is well known. The variations seem be, mainly, degree. Sometimes the patient stays a single day or even a shorter period in a kind of exaggerated lethargy. He is unconscious and externally motionless, but the pulsations of the heart are still faintly perceived, remain some signs of heat, a slight coloration persists in the center of the cheeks and, by applying a mirror to the lips, we can detect a clumsy, uneven, and faltering activity of the lungs. Sometimes the trance lasts weeks and even months, while the exam most thorough and the most rigorous medical tests fail to establish any material difference between the status of the victim and what we conceive as absolute death. As a general rule, it his friends, who know he was suffering, are saved from premature burial previously of catalepsy, and the consequent suspicion, but above all everything saves him the absence of corruption. The disease, fortunately, advances gradually. The first manifestations, although marked, are unequivocal. The attacks are increasing characteristic and each one lasts longer than the previous one. In this lies the greatest security, in order to avoid burial. The unfortunate whose first attack had the severity with which it is sometimes presence, he would almost inevitably be taken alive to the grave. My own case did not differ in any important detail from those mentioned in medical texts. Sometimes for no reason apparent, I was gradually sinking into a state of semi-syncope, or I almost fainted, and that state, without pain, without the ability to move, or really thinking, but with a blurred and lethargic awareness of life and the presence of those who surrounded my bed, lasted until the crisis of the illness suddenly gave me back the perfect knowledge. Other times the attack was quick, devastating. I felt sick, cold, cold, with chills and dizziness, and, suddenly, I feel prostrate. Then, for weeks, everything was empty, black, silent and nothing became the universe. Total annihilation could not be older he woke up, however, from these last attacks slowly and gradually, against the suddenness of the access. As well as the day dawns for the beggar who wanders the streets in the long and desolate winter night, without friends or home, so slow, tired, 
the light of my soul returned joyfully to me. But apart from this tendency to syncope, my general health seemed good, and I would not have been able to perceive that I was suffering from this illness, lest a peculiarity of my dream could be considered caused by it. When I woke up, I could never recover followed the full use of my faculties, and always remained for a long time in a state of bewilderment and perplexity, that mental faculties in general and memory in particular are they were in absolute suspension. In all my sufferings there was no physical suffering, but an infinite moral anguish. My imagination became macabre. She spoke of worms, of tombs, of epitaphs, I was lost in meditations about death, and the idea of premature burial took hold of my mind. The terrifying danger to which I was exposed, he obsessed day and night. During the first, the torture of the meditation was excessive. During the second, it was supreme, when the gloomy darkness spread over the earth, then, pray to the most horrible thoughts, I trembled, I trembled like the tremulous feathers of a hearse. When my nature could no longer stand vigil, I sank into a struggle that finally led me to sleep, because I shuddered thinking that, when I woke up, I could find myself in a tomb. And when I finally sank into sleep, I did so only to fall back, immediately into a world of ghosts, over which he floated with immense and dark black wings the only, predominant and sepulchral idea. Of the innumerable melancholic images that oppressed me in dreams I choose for my story a solitary vision. I dreamed that I had fallen in a cataleptic trance of greater duration and depth than normal. Of suddenly an icy hand rested on my forehead and a voice impatient, gibbering, he whispered in my ear, Get up. I joined. The darkness was total. I couldn't see the figure of the one I had woken up. I couldn't even remember the time it was fallen into a trance, nor the place where I was. While I continued motionless, trying to organize my thoughts, the cold hand he grabbed her wrist tightly, shaking it petulantly while the gibbering voice said again, Get up! Didn't I tell you to get up? And you, I asked, who are you? I have no name in the regions where I live, replied the voice sadly. I was a man and I am a spectrum. He was ruthless, but I am to be pitied. You see that I tremble. My teeth grind when I speak, but it is not because of the cold of the night, of the night eternal. But this horror is unbearable. How can you sleep peacefully? They don't let me rest cries of these long agonies. These shows are more than that I can bear. Get up. Come with me into the outer night, and let me show you the graves. Isn't this a show of pain? Look. I looked, and the invisible figure that was still squeezing my wrist managed to open the tombs of all humanity, and of each one the phosphoric irradiations of decomposition came out in a way that I could see its most hidden corners and the bodies shrouded in their sad and solemn dream with the worm. But, oh! Those who really slept, even if they were many millions, they were fewer than those who did not sleep at all, and there was a weak fight, and there was a sad and general unrest, and of the from the depths of the innumerable wells came the melancholy rubbing of the vestments of the buried. And, among those who seemed rest easy, I saw that many had changed, more or less to a lesser extent, the rigid and uncomfortable posture in which they were buried. And the voice spoke to me again, as I contemplated. But before he could find words to answer, the figure had I let go of my wrist, the phosphoric lights were extinguished and the tombs they closed with sudden violence, while from them came a tumult of desperate cries, repeating, Isn't this, my God? A pitiful sight? Fantasies like this came at night and spread their terrifying influence even on my waking hours. My nerves they were destroyed, and I was seized with continuous horror. I no longer dared to ride a horse, take a walk, or practice any exercise to get me away from home. In fact, I no longer dared to trust him. Away from the presence of those who knew my propensity for catalepsy, for fear that, in one of those attacks, they would bury me before really knowing my status. I doubted the care and loyalty of my dearest friends. 
I feared that, in one more trance longer than usual, they were convinced that there was no longer remedy. He even feared that, as it caused them many discomforts, perhaps they would be happy to consider that an attack prolonged was sufficient excuse to finally get rid of me. In vain they tried to reassure me with the most solemn promises. He demanded of them, with the most sacred oaths, that in no circumstances will bury me until I decay was so advanced that it prevented conservation. And even so my mortal terrors paid no attention to for no reason, they did not accept any consolation. I started with a series of complex precautions. Among other things, I had the crypt remodeled familiar so that it could be easily opened from the inside. To the faintest pressure on a long lever that extended to deep inside the crypt, the gates of iron. The free entry of air and light was also planned, and adequate containers with food and water, within reach of the coffin prepared to receive me. This coffin was padded with a soft and warm material and equipped with a lid made according to the principle of the crypt door, including springs designed from so that the weakest movement of the body would be enough to let go. Apart from this, from the ceiling of the tomb hung a large bell, whose rope would pass, it was planned, through a hole in the coffin and would be tied to one hand of the corpse. But oh! What good is caution against the fate of man? Not even these well-crafted assurances were enough to free one from the anguish extremes of the burial in life of an unfortunate man destined to they. There came a time, as had often happened to me before, when that I found myself emerging from a state of total unconsciousness to the first weak and indefinite sensation of existence. Slowly, with a snail's pace, the pale gray dawn of the day approached psychic. A lethargic restlessness. An apathetic feeling of dull pain. No worry, no hope, no effort. Then, after a long interval, a buzzing sound in the ears. Then, after a longer period of time, a sensation tingling or itching in the extremities, then a period seemingly eternal period of pleasant stillness, during which the sensations that are awakened fight to transform into thoughts, later, another short dive into nothingness, then, a sudden restoration. At last, the slight shudder of a eyelid, and immediately after, an electric shock of terror, mortal and indefinite, sending blood in torrents from the temples to the heart. And then, the first effort to think. And then, the first attempt to remember. And then, a partial success and evanescent. And then, memory has regained both its dominion, that, to a certain extent, I am aware of my state. I feel like I'm not waking up from an ordinary dream. I remember having suffered from catalepsia. And then, finally, as if was the onslaught of an ocean, the only horrendous danger, the only spectral and ever-present idea overwhelms my trembling spirit. The free entry of air and light was also planned, and adequate containers with food and water, within reach of the coffin prepared to receive me. This coffin was padded with a soft and warm material and equipped with a lid made according to the principle of the crypt door, including springs designed from so that the weakest movement of the body would be enough to let go. Apart from this, from the ceiling of the tomb hung a large bell, whose rope would pass, it was planned, through a hole in the coffin and would be tied to one hand of the corpse. But oh! What good is caution against the fate of man? Not even these well-crafted assurances were enough to free one from the anguish extremes of the burial in life of an unfortunate man destined to they. There came a time, as had often happened to me before, when that I found myself emerging from a state of total unconsciousness to the first weak and indefinite sensation of existence. Slowly, with a snail's pace, the pale gray dawn of the day approached psychic. A lethargic restlessness an apathetic feeling of dull pain. No worry, no hope, no effort. Then, after a long interval, a buzzing sound in the ears. Then, after a longer period of time, a sensation tingling or itching in the extremities, then a period seemingly eternal period of pleasant stillness, 
during which the sensations that are awakened fight to transform into thoughts, later, another short dive into nothingness, then, a sudden restoration. At last, the slight shudder of an eyelid, and immediately after, an electric shock of terror, mortal and indefinite, sending blood in torrents from the temples to the heart. And then, the first effort to think. And then, the first attempt to remember. And then, a partial success and evanescent. And then, memory has regained both its dominion, that, to a certain extent, I am aware of my state. I feel like I'm not waking up from an ordinary dream. I remember having suffered from catalepsy. And then, finally, as if was the onslaught of an ocean, the only horrendous danger, the only spectral and ever-present idea overwhelms my trembling spirit. A few minutes after this fantasy took hold of me, I remained motionless. And because? I couldn't muster the courage to move. No, I dared to make the effort to reveal my destiny, without however, something in my heart whispered to me that it was safe. The despair, such as no other kind of misery produces, only desperation pushed me, after a deep doubt, to open my heavy eyelids. I lifted them up. It was dark, all dark. I knew the attack was over. I knew that the critical situation of my disorder had passed. I knew there was regained the use of my visual faculties, and yet everything it was dark, dark, with the intense and absolute lack of light from the night that lasts forever. I tried to scream, and my lips and my dry tongue moved convulsively, but no voice came from the cavernous lungs, which, oppressed as by the weight of a mountain, they gasped and palpitated with their hearts with each laborious inspiration and hard. The movement of the jaws, in the effort to scream, made me show that they were tied, as is done with the dead. I felt also that I was lying on a hard material, and something similar I squeezed the sides. Until then I had not dared to move no limb, but at last I violently raised my arms, who were stretched out, with their wrists crossed. They collided with a solid matter, which extended over my body to no more than six inches from my face. I no longer doubted that he was finally resting inside of a coffin. And then, in the midst of all my infinite misery, it came sweetly hope, like a cherub, because I thought about my precautions. I writhed and made spasmodic efforts to open the lid, I don't know, moved. I touched my wrists looking for the rope, I couldn't find it. And then my comfort fled forever, and a despair still most inflexible reigned triumphant because I could not help but notice the absence of the pads that he had prepared with so much careful, and then suddenly the strong and peculiar smell of wet earth. The conclusion was irresistible. No was in the crypt. He had fallen into a trance far from home, between strangers, I couldn't remember when and how, and they had told me buried like a dog, put in some common coffin, closed with nails, and thrown underground, underground, and forever, in some common and anonymous grave. When this horrible conviction forcefully forced its way into the most intimate part of my soul, I once again struggled to scream. And this second attempt was successful. A long, wild, continuous scream or a scream of agony echoed in the halls of the underground night. Hey, hey, what is that? said a harsh voice, in response. What the hell is happening now? said a second. Get out of there! said a third. Why does he howl like that, like a wild cat? said a room. And then some tough-looking guys grabbed me and they shook without any consideration. They did not wake me from sleep, as I was completely, I woke up when I screamed, but they gave me back full possession of my memory. This adventure occurred near Richmond, Virginia. Accompanied from a friend, had gone down, on a hunting expedition, a few miles along the banks of the James River. Night was approaching when we a storm surprised. The cabin of a small boat anchored in the current and loaded with vegetal soil, it offered us the only affordable shelter. We get the most out of it and we spent the night on board. I fell asleep in one of the two bunk beds, 
No need to describe the bunk beds of a boat of sixty or seventy tons. The one I occupied I had no bedding. It was eighteen inches wide. The distance between the bottom and the deck was exactly the same. It was very difficult for me to get into it. However, I slept deeply, and all my vision, for it was neither a dream nor a nightmare, arose naturally from the circumstances of my position, of the habitual tendency of my thoughts, and of the difficulty, which I have already mentioned, to concentrate my senses and above all to recover my memory for a long time after waking up. The men who shook me were the crew of the boat and some laborers hired to unload it. Of the same load the smell of earth came from. The bandage around the jaws was a silk scarf with which I had tied my head, for lack of sleeping hat. The tortures I endured, however, were undoubtedly equal at that time to those of the true grave. Were from an inconceivable horror, incredibly frightening, but from evil good proceeds, since its very excess caused in my spirit a inevitable reaction. My soul acquired temper, vigor. I went outside. I did hard exercises. I breathed fresh air. I thought of more things that in death. I abandoned my medical texts. I burned Buchan's book. I didn't read more night thoughts, no grandiloquence about cemeteries, no scary stories like this one. In a very short time, I became a new man and lived a man's life. Since that night memorably I cast aside forever my sepulchral apprehensions and with them the cataleptic ailments disappeared, of which perhaps they were less a consequence than a cause. There are times when, even to the calm eye of reason, the world of our sad humanity may seem like hell, but man's imagination is not courageous to explore with impunity all its caverns. Oh, the grim legion of terror sepulchral cannot be considered as completely imaginary, but the demons, in whose company Aphrasiab made his journey through the Oxus, they have to sleep or they will devour us, we must let them sleep, or we will perish.